Good afternoon. This is the Wednesday, November 2nd, 2022, Dr. Cog, Denver Regional Council of Governments Board Work Session. This is your uh, board vice chair, Steve Conklin, chair of this meeting. And I call the meeting to order. With that, uh, first up is public comment. Do we have any public comment? Melinda, let me know if we have anyone that wants to uh, make comment. Um, I do see Allison Coombs hand raised, but I think that she just wanted to be brought over. Uh, she should be able to speak just in case she had any comments she wanted to make. Fair enough. Allison, are you on the line? Oh, maybe she just needed to be brought over. Okay. Uh, and with that, uh, I do not see any other hands raised. Okay. Uh, I will call attention to attachment A, which is the summary of the August 3rd, 2022 board work session. Uh, did anyone have any issues, corrections, changes to that uh, document? Okay. Seeing none, and I am not seeing any hands, so let me know if there is anybody uh, raising hands. With that, we will move ahead to item number four, our panel discussion on the opportunities and challenges associated with economic development district designation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Flo Rotano, Director of Partnership Development and Innovation, who's going to guide that, uh, that panel discussion. Flo? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I am delighted to bring to you a couple of our sister agencies with uh, a varying degree of experience with being designated as an economic development district. Um, many of you will recall that we've been having a conversation about the possibility of the Denver Regional Council of Governments pursuing des designation as an economic development district, um, which is granted by the Economic Development Administration, the EDA, a federal agency. And, and um, we know that you also are always curious as, as to what other COGS and MPOs of similar size and, and experience to Dr. COG, what their experience is. So today I am delighted uh, to bring to you the, the uh, experience that, the, that uh, runs the gamut. And we'll start with the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission. And William Murdoch is the executive director of, of MOIPC. And um, they received their designation in February, so they're brand new to the game. We'll follow William's presentation with the Wasatch Front Regional Commission in uh, our, our sister city across the border in Utah, the Salt, in Salt Lake. And uh, they are actually working on their second um, comprehensive economic development strategy or SEDS. So they've been designated a little bit over four years into their fifth year. So we'll hear about their experience. And then finally, the uh, longest serving and, and with the most experience presenting today will be Marlene Nagel from Mid-America Regional Council in Kansas City. And um, we have made arrangements that, that each of the presenters can run their own show. They can, they can uh, share their screen and run their presentation. We have it here in, in, in uh, backup and ready to go. So um, Doug, unless you have any other introductions you would like to make, um, I'm happy to turn it over to your colleague in, in uh, Columbus, Ohio, um, William Murdoch. Well, I'll let Mor Mor William go ahead. I don't wanna slow us down here, but I will say it's one of the only times I've ever seen uh, William without a tie on. So I'm actually, I was afraid he was gonna upstage me today, but he didn't. So thank you, William, very much. Making me look bad. <laughs> it, it's after five o'clock here, so. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You're up, my friend. Thank you, sir, for being here. Well, great. I will, uh, and thank you for the comment. I will uh, go ahead and try to share my screen. So just a second here. That's perfect, thank you. 
Great. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to present to all of you in Denver and with my colleagues from around the country. Uh, really, uh, we really believe in the economic development district concept. And I think it's something that uh, you'll find a lot of uh, benefit in. And hopefully you can't hear my dog <laughs> four rooms away. I'm just going to power through it as best as I can. Um, actually, hold on a second. I didn't hear the dog. <laughs> All right, <laughs> see if that worked. I'm so sorry. Um, so Morpsey is not yet an economic development district. So we're the 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 one in the incubation stage. Um, I'll get into the details. Uh, we do have an approved SEDS and we are in the application pipeline but we just recently went through this discussion that you're having right now of why should our region even entertain this? So um, that's what I'd like to talk about. So let me tell you about the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission. Uh, we joke that our friends just call us Morpsy. Uh, we are the Regional Council for the Columbus, Ohio area, which is 2.4 million people and we're growing. Uh, you can see on that map there, Columbus is in the middle we have a pretty large geographic area of 15 counties. What's, what's important to know is it's uh, like uh, Dr. Cog, it's rural, it's urban, it's suburban, and it uh, covers a whole different range of communities. And uh, that's something that the Economic Development District will help us knit together. Like Dr. Cog, we perform a lot of the same services. We're an MPO, we're also a rural transportation planning organization. Most importantly, we're a partner to our business community uh, at the regional level where uh, they have regional organizations and we're uh, the counterpart. Just to give you an idea of what it looks like in Ohio and economic development, Ohio splits, the state splits this up into six different districts um, and they have privatized that uh, in Ohio. That red is what's called the One Columbus District and that's the organization that leads business retention and recruitment. We also have a regional chamber of commerce, which is more about member services and educational services to businesses. And then we also have the Mid-Ohio Development Exchange, which is all of the various communities, economic development officials. The, that seems like a lot. The nice thing is they are all under one roof and are staffed by the same staff. So functionally, we have, we have a economic development approach at the regional level, which begs the question, why would the regional council, who does things like transportation and, and that actually get involved in the space. And that's part of what we've been talking about with our economic development peers for years and years because they have a focus on business retention and recruitment, but they don't have that long-term view. And they certainly, especially as private entities, don't have uh, the expertise, the patience, or even the eligibility for federal funds or for the, the planning process. So we've entered into partnership with them where they said, please, could you help us do this? We know planning, we know federal process. When we look at the map around the United States, those, if you can see that well enough, the grayish blue areas are where there are economic development districts. And notably, half of Ohio doesn't have one. And that area represents the major metropolitan areas. <laughs> I see that Denver is also on the list, which is why you're thinking about this now. But it's come to be, become a uh, competitive imperative for us because we look at the rest of the country saying, wait a second, they're getting tools, they're getting grants for businesses, for planning. Um, why don't we have one of those? And so we've been attempting to answer that question in Ohio. Currently, we actually have six economic development districts that are under consideration or at various phases because, again, we're looking at this as uh, part of our competitive strategy to help our businesses and our communities. Just, this was part of our education. Well, what even is an economic development district? Maybe you're getting this too, where we already have these private entities. People say, well, why do we need this? Don't we already have one? And so we've been uh, doing some education, especially with local officials and business leaders that this is a federal designation. It works with the US Economic Development Administration. And it's really helpful because it helps to drive regionally significant economic development plans. and it emphasizes collaboration and strategic development and strategic planning. 
Uh, you know this if you've uh, embarked upon a comprehensive economic development strategy, which is affectionately the SEDS. Uh, that's something that our region had kind of sort of done, but never got approved by EDA until this partnership, where again, as the, the recognized regional planning partner, we were called upon to lead this process and shepherd it through the certification uh, with EDA for 11 counties in um, central Ohio. And we were successful in early 2022. And what's what might be helpful to know is we tried to rush it to get it done. I'm just gonna be transparent in 2020. And they came back and said, no, you, we need more, we need more things. And uh, we were a little bit in a panic in the pandemic and said, well, no, but you're gonna take 10 years to approve this. And EDA to their credit said, here's exactly what we need when you go through the process and do it right, we'll approve it quickly. And they did, they, they approved it just a couple of months after we submitted it. So um, their reputation, at least in the Midwest has not been a positive one with speediness. Perhaps um, uh, you may have the same, but that's not been our experience. So the role that we're looking at for Central Ohio, you see that map there, it has 11 counties. Four of our counties were already in somebody else's district. So we have 15 counties, but the district is only going to be in the 11 that did not. Um, we talk a lot about the benefits. Um, by us being able to administer EDA funding, we can provide technical assistance. And with our economic development private partners arm in arm, uh, we're working much closer on the link between economic development and infrastructure planning. Uh, also with our workforce agencies, um, this is the partnership even before we become an EDD has actually strengthened a lot of our processes and our rela relationships, um, even on the infrastructure level because so much of this is tied to that. Wait, what's really important here is to get the designation, at least through our structure local government, we needed uh, the approval of six of those 11 counties, so a majority. But our board uh, focused on consensus and said that we needed to get all 11 counties. Um, I don't know how this works in Colorado, but they don't often agree on very much. Uh, we have just achieved all 11 counties here in the last month. Uh, we did very hands-on approach, educating them about it, why it helped actually empower some of their local economic development efforts, uh, why it wasn't some sort of central planning takeover of local economic development, but actually a beneficial tool. And uh, we were able to bring very different groups of local governments from different areas together. Uh, so uh, there is hope if uh, that seems like a challenge. Um, we've talked a lot about the criteria, uh, in our region, which is growing, most of us is, are not in economic distress. And so this is something you'll, you probably have looked at. We do have a couple areas that are, um, and that would, uh, enabled us to qualify under the EDA definition for the district. And then of course we had to have the SEDS completed, which was, I said, approved earlier this year. This process was so educational for our team. And I don't uh, know if Doug, um, uh, has has sensed this with his team. Infrastructure planners, our uh, environmental planners, the connection to economic development was not always as strong. And especially because of the variety around the region, that hands-on approach was really eye-opening for a lot of our team. And it, it built some other connections in areas where maybe our regional uh, council was not as strong because we didn't have the relationships. So it's been a good process to, for us to go through. Um, everybody asks us about the benefits. You're probably already into this, but part of that education process was, why do we want one of these? What, what does it uh, create for uh, the region? Does it bring benefits? Um, why should we be patient with federal processes on this? Um, these are the things we told them about, you know, uh, funding for planning and, and economic crises, their strategy grants, public works funding, technical assistance, research, and so on really going through the, the benefits was part of the learning process for us to get to approval. They also wanted to know what money was available. And so we focused a lot on, especially through the pandemic, the Economic Adjustment Assistance Program and the Public Works Program, um, two uh, programs that were very uh, attractive as we were part of this decision process. So here's the takeaways. Um, we 
emphasized around the region that this would help us with regional collaboration and it would benefit development and transportation. It was really important about strengthening that partnership with local governments and their economic development officials. And uh, that relationship continues to deepen. It doesn't mean that we always agree, but it means that, uh, that we're taking a much more eyes wide open approach, much more informed approach um, here just in the last couple of years. And uh, again, we keep emphasizing um, to our colleagues around the region that it opens up opportunities for federal funding. And on that, that note, um, and I don't want this to come off as petty, but during the pandemic, every economic development district in the country got an automatic grant for planning in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And when we heard that and we were looking around, we didn't qualify even though we were facing the same challenges as everybody else. And um, that was a motivating factor. And maybe it's motivating for you to say, Hey, if anything else, we are never going to miss out <laughs> on emergency funding uh, from EDA again. And, you know, it, it was just one of the drivers to, that really put us um, uh, past the point. But I, this has been a great process for us. It's been a good one, and it's very complementary to our efforts. And we're uh, hopeful to receive the designation perhaps before the end of the year um, or early uh, in first quarter of next year. Um, maybe the very last, last thing is what you're doing here is exactly what was helpful to us is learning from some of our colleagues uh, like MARC and others about how does this work? How's it been beneficial? So uh, that's that's the uh, the novice in the room presentation. And I just, again, appreciate the chance to share our EDD story. Thanks, William. And if you can stop screen sharing. There we go. Mr. Chairman, I was planning on having all of the presentations and then save questions for the end. That's fine. Okay, great. So next we'll hear from our neighbors to the West, Salt Lake City, the Wasatch Front. And uh, Marsha, if you're prepared to screen share, we'd love to hear your experience in Salt Lake. Great, we've got it. Unmute, there we go. I have too many screens open. So, well, I my name is Marsha White. Um, I, if you had heard earlier, um, Doug told me I drew the, the short straw. Um, uh, our executive director is doing a regional transportation plan workshop, so. Um, I won't say I'm even the next best thing, but um, I am the economic development director. So um, you'll get to hear uh, from me what I think is important. Um, and William, a lot of the same things that uh, you said, uh, you're, you're gonna hear a lot of that same, um, same thing over and over, I think. But thank you for letting me present to you. Um, I, I have been at Wasatch Front Regional Council just over a year and a half. So. Um, I'm new to the organization, but uh, these wrinkles mean that I've not been new to a lot of organizations. Very similar. Um, we cover five counties. Um, our population is very rural and, you know, we have 12,000 people to up to 1.2 million. Uh, Wasatch Front covers about 60% of the Utah population. Um, and we cover a pretty wide um, 85 miles north and south and 100 miles east and west, but um, a lot of that is also considered the Great Salt Lake, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw that in there. Um, our organization, or the WFEDD, is set up uh, as a, as a um, actually under the, the Wasatch Front Regional Council's um, bylaws, but we have our own bylaws, we have our own mission um, so we're under the umbrella, but we have um, our own um, bylaws. And I think that that was because we actually have been around since 2014. Um, and I think it was the way that the EDA wanted us to set it up at the time. I do believe it's changed. So you look at our, our missions, developing and implementing visions and plans at the, at the high level. And then on our 
uh, on our level or the EDD's level, we're promoting, attracting, and implementing local plans. So if I was you, I mean, you may have way more questions, but I came up with three questions um, that kind of made me think, how do, how do we work in, in our role as an EDD? So how do we compare to the chambers and the other EDCs? And you know, what, what are the state and the county and the, the city economic development folks doing? What has our experience been? And then I also looked at what is the value added um, and hopefully you'll have more questions at the end. I, I, threw, I, throw this, I threw this graphic together because I really believe that um, each of us have our own lane. Um, a lot of times you're asking that question, how do we fit in? How do we do what we do? And, and this is at least in, in Utah's economic ecosystem. And that is, is that the state agencies looking, or, you know, they're looking at the investment and the capital that the local and the, the, the county cities and the counties are looking at how are we going to develop and what are our outcomes going to be through recruitment and expansion. Um, the chambers are doing their thing. So once we get them into the cities, you know, they're, they're trying to retain them and, and create innovation and entrepreneurship um, kind of um, opportunities. And then we also include um, what I call talent and human capital um, and really working with workforce development. I'm sure everyone is just like us where we're just having a, a horrible time getting um, employees to, to come here and to work. So it's really hard to, to do all this recruitment and retention when we can't get the employees here. And then, then lastly, we bring up the, the back end with this regional integration, um, uh, regional um, visions and then trying to put them all together. So the second part of the question, and I think um, you're you're going to hear a lot of the same thing, um, is that, you know, there's obviously there's pros, there's funding opportunities for us. Um, we, we talk a lot about that we're a convener of uh, stakeholders and partners. So our DOT, our transportation authority, um, and, and quite honestly, you know, private businesses and, and, and you know, trying to create those public pri private partnerships. We become a resource to others. Um, the Utah League of Cities and Towns, um, we work together hand in hand with a lot of legislative um, uh, items. And then we have, I call this the regional goals and objectives where, we're kind of just, we're trying to create a, more of a, maybe not project oriented goals and objectives, but more of what are our outcomes? You know, how are we gonna, how, how are we gonna um, move people from, you know, that 85 mile uh, span? So, and then the last part that we don't talk about very often, but is that regional equity and are we bringing equity into all parts of our region, not just, you know, where like for instance, chambers are membership driven, therefore, you know, maybe they're they're looking at more of their membership or even some of our, our EDCs are, are membership driven. So we begin to bring that equity into, into the, the mix. I'm not gonna lie, um, reporting is, is, uh, is what you, you guys probably know this because you do federal grants, but, it just seems like there's a report that's always due, um, always due, always due. Um, we've got the five-year SEDs that we always um, or that we have to do, but you also have to do annual updates. You have to do um, progress reports, and then all of a sudden they throw this, "Hey, how about a peer review with some, you know, you know, a, somebody in 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 the region?" So, um, but you do you do that? I mean, you guys are you you manage federal programs and and state programs, so you're probably well aware of that. Um, and then, um, you know, there's just some internal processes because of the, the reporting, you're gonna have to have just a different structure um, for, you know, your finance structure, just um, so that you can have the, the money come down and you're using it for what you need to use it for. Um, the, I already mentioned this, but about the EDCs, um, you know, there's there's some cons to that. And that is, is that we don't really, I mean, if I tried to tell 
one of our economic development people at, at the county level or the city level that they had to do something, they'd probably laugh me out of the, the um, meeting. But, you know, just trying to really figure out how we fit in. And that's what that previous slide is, is doing. And I think the one thing, the funding's not guaranteed. So you can put in for a grant. Um, the, the planning and partnership grants, once you get it, those are in um, perpetuity, but um, the grants that you're trying to get for, you know, other types of grants, like um, the the ones that William put up earlier, and they're not guaranteed. So, that, you know, you have to do matching and you, it's they're competitive grants. Um, and the other thing that's been really hard, and, and I'm sure you guys are feeling this too, but, um, you know, the projects are really limited to economic development. So, where we, where everybody's a transportation organization and you maybe can see you can see the end goal of a, a trail actually helping economic and, and driving economic you know development to an area the the EDA doesn't um, that doesn't fit into their um, their guidelines or a workforce housing um, you know project or something like that. So sometimes it gets to be, a little bit of a challenge because it really is only for economic development. And the last thing I think, um, in fact, I just wrote down what William had said, but these are very similar. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I get to be is I, I, I call myself a little bit like Switzerland because I don't have to, I don't care where an, a company relocates. I don't care where they you know, what we do, I don't care. I want to just make sure that our region is 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 being and, and having the greatest assets that we can have. Um, and then that's kind of that no, no boundaries. So we don't know other than the, the region, but I don't know where the city boundary is. And so I'm not really looking at, at um, city boundaries or county boundaries. And the one thing that I think is important too, because I know that our council is made up of elected officials, but the WFEDD, by virtue of how the EDA makes you set it up, is that you have to have elected officials, um, and then um, and then stakeholders and businesses. And so we've brought on, you know, we have a elected officials, but then we have non-elected officials. We have state officials. We have private businesses, we have small um, businesses, we have large businesses, we have universities that sit on our board. And so that's kind of fun because you bring a lot of different people to the table. Uh, and then one of the things, and I, I, I actually believe this too, and then William actually men mentioned this, but we did get um, uh, disaster re relief um, in when, when COVID hit. And so we got a $400,000 grant that we were able to fund seven different projects that we wouldn't normally have been able to fund. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I, I think that it's just a, a really important, um, for at least our region, it's been really important for us to be part of that collaboration and be in the mix and be part at, at the table too. So I think that's all I have. Yep. Thanks, Moesha. Yeah. So we're saving questions to the end. And now Marlene, the most seasoned of the uh, three presentations tonight. So if you'd like to share your screen and start your presentation, that'd be great. Right. There we go. Sorry. Um, well, thank you. I'm I serve as community development director for Mid America Regional Council, and um, I think David Warm, who's our executive director, is on, and and he could perhaps amplify after I share some information. You know, I would say that um, we we have a long experience, but our experience is similar to what William. Um, and Marcia have shared. Um, we've we've certainly learned a lot over um, the last few number of years. So a little bit about Mark. Um, we're we were formed in 1972 um, from a merger of two regional organizations. 
We're, we have a 33 member board of uh, directors. They're all local elected officials. We serve nine counties and two states. Um, and there's 119 cities. And I would say about two thirds of them are small communities in terms of population. We have a um, overall population of 2.1 million and uh, uh, we cover a large geography of about 4,400 square miles. Um, so I was gonna share with you kind of a little bit about the background and our advisory board, um, a little bit about the use of funds, maybe how that's changed over the years and how we're supporting the economic development district. Um, and then a bit about our uh, SEDS strategy and um, the importance um, that we've identified of the EDA designation. So we did start a long time ago and I have been with Mark a long time and I was even having a hard time remembering um, some of the history, um, but we began discussions with EDA back in the, um, the late 1990s. And at the time, a number of more rural regional councils in Missouri had been designated and they were helping their small local communities make progress on uh, with infrastructure and other things that EDA was able to fund. And so we saw it as an opportunity really to not only serve our region, but to, in particular to help some of our smaller jurisdictions. Um, so we prepared our first um, plan in 1999 and sort of formally uh, began making a request for the designation in 2000. And it took us six years to achieve that. And I recall that we, um, I don't recall that, um, that we had, like William said, that they, we had to get the approval of every county uh, governing board, but we did seek uh, letters of support from all of our counties. And at the time we were an eight county region. Um, and so, and then we had to get support from the mayor of the largest city and the two governors. And so we got letters of support from all of those um, uh, officials. And then we uh, received our first uh, planning partnership grant in 2006. Um, so, you know, the EDA designation of the advisory board has changed a bit over time, but they required initially, and I think they still do, that it be a pri kind of a private nonprofit uh, organization. So our mark as an organization is a public not-for-profit. So it, um, a little bit before we actually sought um, or received the designation, we formed a 501c3. It's a, for all practical purposes, a subsidiary of, of our um, main organization. And our budget and personnel committee made up of uh, some of the chief local elected officials from around the region, they serve as the advisory board for the economic development district. But uh, EDA has made some changes in their requirements. And so we really, we have a, we're gonna, a group called the Regional Workforce Intelligence Network, and they kind of serve as our advisory committee in terms of bringing economic development, workforce development, local government professionals and others together to um, kind of help us in, um, in developing the plan and thinking about how we um, provide support through, the, uh, through our economic development district. So the, some of the ways in which we use funds and support the district, um, when we first um, started our work, and I think it continues today, is we help a lot of very small communities with planning assistance, grant writing, and project management. One of the more important things, and I think Marcia mentioned that, is just sort of the convening of stakeholders. I would say that Mark does not view itself as an economic development organization, but it having the economic development district uh, designation sort of gives us status in the eyes of the regional and local economic development groups that we work with, um, the workforce agencies and others, that we have an important role in that ecosystem. And so we, and there really isn't any other organization in our region that convenes across education, workforce, um, 
local economic development, both in terms of attraction and retention, small business support. So we are trying to bring together diverse stakeholders. Um, and, and one of the roles that we are recognized for, and I think your organizations are too, as uh, because of your transportation planning role, is just we have a strong economic and workforce um, uh, data and analysis capability, and we're looked to um, uh, for that. And in fact, over the last probably 10 years, we have we have really focused on workforce development because that's been a real issue with um, and need in our uh, community for um, for really um, advancing economic development, uh, especially with, with regard to equity. So we also, as part of the uh, district responsibilities, we prepare the SEDS. And as Marcia said, we try and track um, annual progress. Um, we also play a role in bringing um, stakeholders together when there's the opportunity for federal and state grants um, to try and not have lots of competing uh, requests going out, but to really show how our community can work together. And um, we've had some real success with EDA over the years. Uh, the, at one point, they had a large grant that involved the Department of Labor, the Small Business Administration, and EDA, and, and we brought partners together and we were successful in um, securing that grant. We've, we've um, achieved uh, success with a number of planning grants and, and some others uh, that EDA has made available. Um, there's a, an initiative that we started with um, our uh, regional uh, agencies that promote economic development, a business leadership organization called the Civic Council, uh, and created a, an effort in uh, 2015 called Casey Rising. And it was really uh, um, following a, a pretty intensive analysis of our region's economy and what we really needed to do to to um, be more economically competitive, uh, both a, across the country and, and globally, and um, with a, a real focus on equity. And so that um, the Casey Rising Project has really helped us in sharpening our goals and objectives of what we see as important for the region economically. Um, some of the other things that we do is we have, um, we've established really strong relationships with the EDA program officers, both those in, the, in Kansas and Missouri, as well as the Denver office. Um, and I have to say of all the federal agencies that we have worked with over the years, they are terrific. They are, they wanna help us solve problems. They wanna help us put our best foot forward for grants. And so they will, um, I think, unlike a lot of federal agencies that don't feel like they can be as open and um, and helpful in um, with organizations that are um, seek, seeking funds, um, I have found the EDA organization as as one that's really very helpful. Um, and we so we've been able to both um, secure grants that we have a stake in, but also helping others be successful. Um, and, uh, and I think we've helped our EDA program officers learn more about the region and about the organizations that really are helping to drive uh, economic and workforce development in the region. Um, regarding the, the SEDS preparation, um, you know, it's the, the information around our policy agenda. It relates to our transportation planning work. It relates to our climate action uh, plan um, and um, and as um, uh, you know Marcia said it, it the um, extra dollars that we received um, helped us in thinking about um, economic resiliency um, and recovery economic recovery um, and um, and we paired that with resources we received from uh, local foundations um, kind of on the public health side, but looking at how as a region we help those who were most affected economically and to help them um, kind of take some positive steps forward as we as our whole region works to recover. We've, we've done quite a bit of looking at how our region compares to other peer metro areas 
We've gained a lot of as, uh, insights on regional assets and organizations. Um, and we try and track economic development activity um, in the region, which helps us with our transportation planning and, and, and other things that we're doing. And so we, um, we through the, um, the special grant we received, we've um, worked to update our, our SEDS. Um, our last one was prepared just before the pandemic started. So we've kind of looked at how our policy framework and some of our goals and strategies have changed given our um, analysis of our uh, strengths and, and weaknesses and opportunities. Uh, we've been sharing that information with our MARC committees and others and, um, and sending out a draft plan for, for feedback. You know, I, again, I think our, um, what we've identified as what's important on the EDA designation is probably very similar to what William and Marcia have said. Um, it has allowed us to review the region's progress and identify steps that, whether it's our organization or others might take um, to help uh, improve our region's ability to, to take positive steps forward. Uh, it's allowed us to engage uh, broad community stakeholders um, and to learn more about the region's organizations that are addressing economic development that, uh, and workforce development, and then to support our local jurisdictions that are pursuing grants. Um, and and I, although the planning partnership grant is a fairly modest grant, um, it is an important one and provides an important foundation. So that's. Thanks, Marlene. Um, I'd like to thank our, our speakers and presenters because I know how much work they put into this because I've been talking with them for a couple of months now. So I, I know that they there was a lot of work that they put into this. Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it back to you. Great, yeah, thank you very much. I wanna give some time for questions. I do wanna say that because we've got another presentation, we need to, to you know, by five o'clock, move on to our next subject. So would ask everybody to, to uh, just keep time in mind as you ask questions and uh, our presenters as well. Thank you all for being here. Uh, any questions? I'm not seeing hands yet. Everyone. I will just say this was incredibly helpful, Lisa. Yes, um, I'm just wondering what would be someone's reason, like a municipality or uh, elected person's reason not to support uh, an economic development district? Great question. Any of our presenters like to handle that? Um, I, I, I'll just quickly say, as I'm, I'm a, a city council person in my my city, and I think sometimes we get kind of we get so siloed and so focused on what we can do that um, that uh, they, we just don't look at outward. And so I think that that's probably the biggest thing. But from a but I think what we're seeing is a shift in economic development, and we're seeing that we have to regionally play together or I mean, you know, that that 400 job, per, uh, you know, manufacturing company is going to look elsewhere where they do have regional um, planning. And so we're, we're, we're seeing that happen. But Yeah, I think we said the the only downside that I would think a local official might have is if they felt like um, the regional organization were applying for an, a, a competitive EDA grant, which occurs from time to time and a local community or a local economic development group is also applying. So they think there's competition, but I, but I think it's very rare where a local official would see, would be threatened by the regional designation. Yeah, and just to, to add to those great answers, uh, part of it's uh, with our educational outreach with our local governments has been addressing misconceptions or concerns and that, the concern that hasn't been mentioned is, uh, does this diminish their local economic development efforts? Does this mean that uh, some big regional uh, plan is going to tell them what to do? And if anything, when we've been talking to them, our experience has been this is actually uh, a value add. It's it's not an either or, it's a both and. And um, that took a little bit of conversation in some of our communities, but um, we were able to get there. 
Great, thank you very much. And Director Smith, thank you for the great question. Uh, Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just, my the questions that I was asking as our presenters were giving their very um, detailed information, and thank you for that, was if we knew whether any of our local economic development entities applied for and received those same grants along the same lines of, of the comp competition, or if in fact um, there was money, uh, grant money, federal grant money that was, lack of a better term, left on the table in our area. And if we don't know the answer now, then I think that we need to if this progresses to where we start having conversations with them, we find out about the level of their um, grant acquisition up till now. Thank you. Does anyone on staff have thoughts about that or our presenters? Madam Chair, if I may, I float. Mr. Rex. I'll yield the floor, floor, floor to flow here in a second, but I just wanted to say, I think, you know, Director Baker, I think that's what we're that's the, that's the analysis we're kind of going through right now. I do know that during COVID, there was a waiver that allowed anyone who was not even in a, those that were even not in an economic development district to apply for certain grants that were, they would, would not normally be eligible for. Um, and I, I really, you know, something that Williams said really struck home with us. And I think it's the conversation that we're having right now with economic development professionals around the region, those that have not worked elsewhere where there has been an economic development district, I think they they come with a puzzled look as to what we're trying to accomplish with this with this uh, designation. And um, Flo and I have been pretty straightforward with folks is that, listen, we're we don't want to get in your kitchen. Right. I mean, we're trying to explain the differences between what it is of we're trying to provide versus what they are currently providing. And if there is not value added and if there's not a synergistic relationship, then this is not something we have any interest in at all. So it's really, we're leaving it up to the locally elected officials as well as the economic development professionals in this region to make the determination of whether this is important enough for us to pursue. Um, and just so you all know, I'm hoping to have a recommendation for you all by you know January's timeframe of whether we should pursue this or not. We're just, we're still collecting information, but I think that's a great question and we will try to answer that with our economic uh, with EDA uh, local office, Jeff. So thank you, sir. Thank you, Doug. Yes, Director and let Trump. me just add, add on to that, that, that in conversations that we've already had, one most recently with the economic development director at Denver South, um, when she was in Governor Owen's cabinet, her experience was that she was being asked by other federal agencies that were referenced tonight, USDA and HUD being two of them, um, about the designation uh, of the Denver region as an EDD, because that, that adds points and makes an application more competitive. And, and we lost a number of those because we did not have that designation. So that's going back wow. all the way to Governor Owen's administration, so. Thank you, Flo. Thank you. Director Kraft Tharp. Thank you. So my question really has to do with I think this train of thought that we're on, um, it went back to the previous speaker who talked about um, that this is not a uh, or, it's an and. I'm concerned about diminishing, um, uh, duplicating, replicating, um, undermining our economic development corporations. Our, our, um, I mean, we in Jeffco, we, I mean, we have a pretty strong EDC. We have very strong, um, uh, chambers. Um, so if we could kind of expand on how is this not um, overlaying on top of them, duplicating, replicating, whatever. And then have we started to reach out to them to explain to them? Because it would, I think it will take a little bit of handholding to be able to explain that we're not um, taking them over. Thank you. I might be able to give our most recent experience with that. It's a it's a great question, and to be honest, our our regional economic uh, development players, uh, for years, they invite us to some of those meetings, but they 
they didn't want us to go very far on this. And what changed about that was the more they learned about EDA and the types of resources that were available and the types of organizations that EDA is comfortable with, uh, they, they turned to us and said, all right, we need to do this together. And for us, that was a really core concept that if we were going to do this, we needed our regional economic development groups uh, to support it and to work closely with us. And then together we, we engaged uh, the local economic development entities across the region and brought them up to speed. And that all happened prior to us approaching the elected officials for uh, approval recommendation letters. That, that took a little bit of legwork. I think uh, the pandemic allowed us to focus everybody on what uh, the tools that we were missing and uh, that, that helped with the, the collaborative approach. But um, it, it did take some education, but uh, once we got there, we, I don't wanna jinx myself, but we have unanimous support with the entities in the region. Um, and that, that wasn't something that, that we had uh, before this conversation started. Great, thank you very much. Anyone else? Um, I would say that um, one of the things over the years that we have tried to do is to really be supportive of local efforts at securing grants, whether it was for infrastructure, for an industrial park or helping um, a, a community with um, a small business effort that um, that EDA was interested in funding. We helped demonstrate to EDA how that project was consistent with the SEDS. And so we really helped the, the local um, organization put their best foot forward to the EDA. And so I think in a lot of ways, we were viewed as helpful to the local economic development process. And if I could chime in really quickly too, and, and in our area, we have, um, where we have, you know, Salt Lake City is obviously our most populated area, but we have small communities that really don't have economic development. Um, um, I mean, they just don't have the people to help do it. And so they look to us to help them do some of that too. And so I think that there's, it, it's not just for the, the big areas, it's for maybe some, some of the smaller communities as well. Great, thank you. Director Leedy. Yeah, thanks. I think I might have some questions that are similar to perhaps what um, Director Kraft Tharp raised. And, um, and it, um, because we do have the Regional Tourism Authority, we, the governor has a, you know, OEDIT that, that awards um, economic development funds and so I would be interested in, and maybe this is more of a discussion just for us on the board together with, with Doug Rex and Plo Raitano about how we would structure this. But I think my question is how, whether it's possible to um, craft, if we were to do an economic development district, but craft a purpose for us that would be about the, the planning and the data analysis and and the infrastructure needs and it, the things that would really complement and enhance what we do as an MPO and not get in people's way that are already doing economic development. You know, can we, can we define for ourselves what we want this EDD to be? I could jump in again because this was a question that was was asked. Um, part of uh, our partnership with our regional economic development entity was that they would do what they do best, and we would focus on what we do best. And in our region, their core is on business retention, recruitment, and expansion. Uh, you know, the incentive deals, uh, the working directly with companies to get them located. We we've carved out our role much more as the community development, infrastructure, federal grant support side of that economic development equation. Um, so we developed that in partnership with that, that group. Now, when we applied to USEDA, they wanted us as the eligible entity to apply for the district. They wanted us to focus on our role, uh, but regionally we were able to define that um, and although we're not a district yet, that's how we're operating in practice. And 
that allows us to to focus on our strengths and not get into the business um, that they're in. I don't know if that's my colleagues uh, in Salt Lake or Kansas City's experience. I, I think that's true. I think what we were in, what we tried to be intentional about as well as in the SEDS document is to identify and recognize the important role that other organizations play so that it's sort of clear sort of what our role is and what their role is. And we try and identify those um, projects or investments where EDA support could be helpful um, so that uh, a local sponsor could, could make an application and we'd be able to say that that project is consistent with our regional plan. But it's not necessarily a project that we would implement, but something that we would support. Hey, Director Harrison. Thank you very much. Um, and this would go, this is a question more for those who have been doing this for a while. Um, in regard to COVID and the ups and downs of the economic cycles that we all go through that seem to be happening much more often, right? What has, what has been the outcome of your involvement with those um, regional communities and their economic development in terms of trying to stabilize at some level their economy to kind of get through those rough patches? Have you seen tangible evidence where that has helped minimize that impact of those ups and down life cycles with your involvement? Well, I would say in this um, last pandemic, pandemic, when um, EDA had some CARES Act dollars available early on. And so we brought together um, the economic development um, and small business interests in our most distressed county. And we jointly put together an application and received funding um, to support small business assistance and, um, and workforce assistance in that particular county. But it was, we were, we were, we received the grant, we administered it, but a lot of the dollars flowed through to our um, our workforce board or in, and um, some small business um, organizations to really provide strong support to those that were most affected. I think we also, as part of our analysis of the pandemic, we have really tried to look at um, what our region has excelled in, in terms of our industry sectors and coming out of the pandemic, do we need to change that focus? And we do that in cooperation with our regional economic development partners. So it's not just Mark's um, uh, in, you know, um, analysis, but it's really the region's analysis of where we need to be focusing our efforts to, um, to, to be stronger moving forward. And for that feedback from those communities, from those uh, smaller organizations, what has been that feedback in terms of going in and then coming out? Have they been very grateful, obviously, for that? We did not expect the federal government to be this effective in terms of being able to find the funding available to help stabilize us. Is there what feedback have you received? I, you know, I would say that our feedback has probably been strongest around workforce development because even those communities that faced economic um, losses in terms of um, businesses um, leaving or you know shuttering their operations or certainly cutbacks, um, most of our jobs have come back. But the problem has been finding the talent, and there's really been a shift to equity of understanding who was most affected and how as a region, if we want to, if we really want to make progress in the future, we've really got to bring everyone along and we've got to address our uh, training and education system and we've got to help um, people with the challenges they face. And, and so I think that has helped us, whether it was a, lot, a small um, agency, a small community or a larger one of recognizing it's kind of a regional workforce system. It's a very valuable lesson learned. Any other feedback from anybody else? Um, we, we did very similar projects. Um, just so you know, like um, the, the workforce, um, uh, we were able to actually um, shift people's thinking. So we worked with um, a local um, tech college 
to um, do uh, QuickBooks training and also uh, online marketing. And so a lot of these in this little town, a lot of these folks, you know, these little retail shops were they they were about ready to go out of business, but they were able to shift their focus into more of an online retail. Um, and so um, many of those um, small businesses did not receive PPP because they didn't have, you know, their books weren't very good or whatever. And so um, so we just recognized that that there was a need there. And this is now an ongoing class that's being offered through um, the tech college. So hopefully, you know, just again, perpetuating the, the good that came out of that. Um, and then the other really great project that we did um, was a broadband study. And we realized that there were, I mean, people had broadband in very great neighborhoods uh, along the Wasatch Front. It's just that when they got home and we have a lot of we have a lot of children um, in our in our um, state, and they got home, and they, just everybody trying to access it was was not very good. So they're creating policies around developers and and some of those things. So um, you know, just good outcomes, maybe not to the the you know, what Marlene was saying, but we just had some really good outcomes with the money that we used there. So great. Thank you very much, and Director Harrison, thank you for the question. I uh, want to thank Marsha and Marlene and William. Uh, great information, very, very helpful. And uh, Mr. Rex, turn it over to you for some closing comments. Thank you, sir, very much. And I also would like to thank our guests today. Um, I, just a little bit on what, as far as next steps, um, Flo and I will continue to reach out to economic development professionals here uh, over the next uh, couple months. We're planning on getting in front of uh, Metro Denver EDC's uh, group of economic professionals. They have, they have a, a, I don't know if it's monthly or quarterly meeting of all the economic professionals within our region. And we're really hoping to have a good dialogue with them about uh, what this, what we believe this is and what it isn't and, uh, and get the reaction to that. So we'll pursue that and get some additional information back to you all. Um, but I did want to say in closing that, listen, we have a, we have a, we're very lucky and blessed to have a lot of really good people in the regional planning world. Um, and it's certainly exemplified by the, the leaders of the three agencies that we have here tonight. Um, we're, we're so blessed. We asked them once and they were more than happy to do it, right? So they're taking time out of their busy schedule. So we thank you so very, very much. Special shout out, I always got to do this. Many of you don't know, but I, I started my career in Kansas City at Mid-America Regional Council back in the early 90s. And uh, both David and Marlene were established leaders even back then. And uh, so happy to, to see both of them and them doing well and, and uh, looking forward to uh, our conversations in the future. So thank you all so very much. Thank You're you, Doug. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Best wishes. And, and also thanks to Flo. Uh, Flo, we very much appreciate you uh, coordinating this and, and uh, helping with that panel. So thank you very much. With that, we will continue on to a briefing on the Administration for Community Living's Community Care Hub model. That's a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> and I will turn it over to Jayla Sanchez. Uh, Jayla, go ahead. And... <laughs> Sorry, hey, I got everyone. all tangled Jayla there. Sanchez Warren. I'm the Director of the Area Agency on Aging. I'd like to introduce you to AJ Diamantopoulos. Um, AJ has had a few roles in the Area Agency on Aging. He worked uh, first in the Community Care Transitions Program. Then he ex successfully applied for and got the Accountable Health Communities Demonstration Grant, um, the only Area Agency on a Aging in the country to do so. Um, he ran that program successfully for five years, and now I've got him doing um, resource and partnership development. You know, our population of older adults is growing rapidly. Our funding isn't keeping pace. We need to develop new partnerships. He's going to tell you about a new opportunity. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid and other health insurance companies are increasing their efforts to address health-related social needs of people they serve, things like transportation and food and in-home services. Um, and to respond to this new demand, community-based organizations like ours and our contractors across the country are forming networks to decrease the administrative burden and leverage and share the new funding opportunities. 
I think this project is perfect for the Area Agency on Aging, but more importantly, the administration on community living thinks so too, and they are strongly encouraging Area Agencies on Aging to get involved in this effort. AJ is going to tell you what we're thinking and what we're doing to explore this opportunity. So take it away, AJ. Thank you, Jayla. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, based on my last name, I try to make every title long and, and incomprehensible, so sorry about that. Um, but let me share my screen here. <clears throat> let me see. All right, can you all see that? And I swear this works. There we go. How about now? Good. For some reason, my computer uh, puts subtitles on every presentation I give, so uh, <laughs> I think I'm the only one, <clears throat> but here we go. So as Jayla said, I'm going to talk to you today about a community integrated health network and a community care hub. Um, so just to uh, give you a baseline of it, um, a, a I don't want to call it a chin or a sin, both sound bad. So I think I'll just call it a, a network. So uh, the network we're discussing is one of community-based organizations that provide coordinated and consistent delivery of services to assist people in our community. It should sound very familiar. Um, the theory being that the community organizations know what their clients and their communities need best and are best suited to deliver those services. Um, and if they band together in a network, they can um, lower their uh, administrative burden and increase their service provision. Uh, to accomplish that, the network is managed by a community care hub. Um, the hub acts as that single point of accountability, that interface with the healthcare organization, the health insurance company, or other interested uh, party. Um, and that way, the, the, the hub uh, takes on that burden or that role, I should say, um, and uh, allows everybody else to benefit financially as well. So it's um, uh, in for a penny, in for a pound, everybody shares in the benefit, everybody shares in the responsibility. Uh, so the hub uh, works with those contracting agencies, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, and uh, provides the necessary infrastructure and, and importantly, ensures the quality of services uh, among many things. Um, and just to give you kind of a, a baseline of what we're talking about, I, I created this slide uh, to give you an overview of how similar this is. And I'll, I'll say at the outset, based on feedback I got from um, Rich Morrow, um, uh, there are differences between these two boxes on this slide. Uh, they're just very subtle. So the role of an area agency on aging um, is to serve older Coloradans in our region as required by the Older Americans Act. I should say the role of our area agency on aging. Uh, and the role of a community care hub and its network is to serve people in our region referred by insurance and healthcare organizations. Uh, AAA receives and provides stewardship of federal and state funds, and the hub would receive and provide stewardship of contracted funds. Uh, the AAA recruits funds and holds accountable a network of community-based organizations to provide Older Americans Act services. And the hub does that exact same thing uh, but with a network of community-based organizations to provide services, not just older American Act services. All right, All right so uh, why a hub? Um, uh, and due to uh, Zoom, I can't see my own slides, so I apologize for that. But um, so we have, as, as the Dr. Cog AAA, we have over 50 or almost 50 years of experience managing a network of community-based organizations. Um, Jayla and I were just traveling together and we realized that the AAA was 48 years old, which was uh, <laughs> quite a shock. Um, we have local knowledge in, in this region uh, and the history of what has happened here in the region with all the different iterations of healthcare and community-based services and um, we know how to build and manage effective networks of community-based organizations. And as Jayla mentioned, um, we have a lot of experience uh, going back to 2012, uh, I believe 2012 or 13, when we first received the community-based care transitions funds from 
the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. We've been working intimately with healthcare um, ever since, and that's 10 years. Uh, most recently, we've worked in healthcare organizations, big health systems, small uh, doctor's offices, helping to design these workflows and screen people for social needs and refer them to community-based organizations for services. All right, and to give you a, a, an overview, this is happening across the country. Um, this is a map I received from uh, US Aging, the National Association of AAAs, and they did a survey uh, nationally to find where this type of contracting with healthcare organizations, uh, networks, network development, um, and contracting with healthcare organizations or no activity whatsoever. Um, uh, we are, the state of Colorado is in the contracting phase. There's a few contracts between healthcare organizations and community-based uh, providers, uh, but those are falling by the wayside. Um, and so we're hoping with the new uh, emphasis that uh, Medicare and Medicaid are putting on screening and referral for social needs, uh, that we will have uh, quite a few opportunities in the near future to uh, build the network and contract with these organizations. Um, but many, many states uh, are doing this um, as well. It's become uh, pretty much the, I can't say the norm because there's a lot of states without squiggly lines, but it's getting there. Um, and so to give you an idea and not to rely too much on the Mid-America Regional <laughs> Council in both presentations, um, they operate a network like this uh, in Kansas City. They call it the Managed Services Network and they provide coordination of services. So this is a, a diagram of their, uh, basically their workflow. Uh, and so the blue boxes on the left um, are uh, the organizations that send referrals um, to them. They have contracts with these organizations. They have, um, uh, from what I understand, uh, three contracts with these types of entities. Those healthcare providers uh, assess their, their patients, and then if needed, they refer them to the uh, MSN, which um, has uh, staff that uh, triage the referrals, send them to the appropriate organization for services, and then they report the um, service information back to the healthcare entity, which is very important to the healthcare entities based on a lot of my work. I know they're very interested in, in not only knowing that their, their clients or patients receive the service, uh, but how often so they can uh, track them and make sure they're, they're following their healthcare plan as, long, as well as their community care plan. Um, and that uh, uh, is kind of a broad overview of what we've discovered uh, across the country and based on our work. Um, the, the hub model is an iteration. It's, it's been around for a while, as we said with the, with the area agencies on aging um, as the start, but it's really um, come to the fore lately as um, private health insurance companies are very eager to contract with community-based organizations um, to address their members' uh, social needs to lower their cost of care. Um, and with that, uh, I will, I can figure out how to stop sharing my screen. Um, uh, I'll take any questions if there are any out there. Great, thank you, AJ. Thank you, Jayla. Any uh, questions on this topic? Mr. Rex. Thanks so very much. Oh, I see Director Levy raised her hand. I'll, I'll be brief. I just wanted to, um, you know, this this stuff gets pretty complicated pretty quickly, right? And I think we're trying to bring it to you guys in, in, in you know, small bits so we can we can all try to learn as we go with this. Um, you know, Jayla mentioned, I mean, you know, we're facing somewhat of a fiscal cliff here in a few years. And I think we're, we're really looking for new ways to help us find some additional funding to to uh, make sure that the one, the services that we've provided during COVID to individuals can continue, but of course we wanna be able to expand this. And I think that's why the, um, the Administration for Community Living is very interested in this approach. And unfortunately, I don't know if someone mentioned this, that, um, that, that, the, um, that Kelly Cronin 
uh, the deputy administrator. She was hoping to join us this evening, but she couldn't make it. So we're going to schedule a time in the not so distant future for her to come back on and explain to her what the interest, what the interest of the federal government is related to this program. And um, but it has shown success in areas where it has been implemented. I think that's the important thing. Um, that it, there's an opportunity here that we can find some sustainable monies outside of the normal channels that we typically have for our older adults. So we're encouraged by it. It's another one of these that we're continuing to explore. Um, but I think this is one that we have a lot more interest and enthusiasm about um, uh, than uh, you know, the previous conversation. Not saying we're not enthusiastic about the EDD designation, but I think we need, need to learn a lot more about that one than this one even. So. Um, I'll leave it there and um, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Dr. Leedy. Thanks. Um, this, this looks like it has a whole lot of huge potential. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm just always one who's a little cautious about, um, you know, what are, what are the downsides? You know, it's an obvious question, but, and the thing I, I uh, the thing that's top of mind, I guess, for me is, do we get enough money to, along with this, um, you know, being the whatever it is, <laughs> um, to to actually perform the what's expected of us? What I worry about is um, we we want to, you know, we're accountable. We want to provide these services. It's like being a managed care organization, and you're supposed to manage all these dollars and have these great outcomes and. And is the pressure going to be to reduce costs, the cost of services to the point where we feel like we're not serving clients? So it, I'm not expressing this very well, but what I'm thinking about and um, is I'm thinking about Innovate, frankly. Yeah. And that they are falling down on the job. They're not serving people. And I don't want us to be in of age. And yeah, so tell me I, that I'm way off base. <laughs> Let me go first, AJ, and then you you do sure. the technical piece. Um, so uh, you're so smart. So, so smart. Because um, how many times have we seen I'm this? I'm a good right warrior. Where... <laughs> <laughs> okay. How many times have we seen this? I actually predicted what was happening with Innovage, and um, that's why we work so hard to get a, a long-term care or a, a, a ombudsman program for those those uh, folks in in uh, PACE programs. So, yes, I'm right there with you. We are already doing this, um, Director Levy. We're already serving these folks. Hospitals are already making referrals to us. Um, we have 19 hospitals in the metropolitan area and they're making referrals to us. And we don't have any new money to help us with this. Um, we are drowning in referrals right now. And we are trying to level the playing field. The hospitals are getting incentivized to make referrals to community-based organizations, but the community-based organizations are not getting paid to provide the service. You've heard me say this before, um, referrals don't change health outcomes, services do. We need to get in this space where community-based organizations are getting paid to do the coordination and the tracking and the monitoring and the service. We're not there yet. This is, we know this is coming down the pike. Um, uh, and this is a first step in being ready for the, the national um, response to community-based services. That's where AJ, AJ and I were in Washington, D.C. last week, learning about the new kind of plans that Medicare and Medicaid are, are having. Um, and community-based organizations are a key part of that. Our small community-based providers like Seniors Resource Center in Jefferson County or um, Senior Hub in Adams County, they don't have the bandwidth to participate in these things. The only way they will be able to participate is if it, they're in a larger network. We already do this, and so we think we're we're set we're we're well suited to do this. But the money is it has to come with money. Um, so AJ, go ahead. 
Well, I, I just add that um, that's why the, the network model makes so much sense um, from a, a sheer entrepreneurial perspective. If a hospital came to uh, you know seniors resource center, or I should say via transportation services, and said, "I'll give you you know ten dollars per ride for a hundred thousand patients," um, they could then go to uh, a little a little ride and say, "I'll give you nine dollars per ride for a hundred thousand. And all of a sudden, we're in a competition for a service uh, that is already um, for the community. Uh, and so by creating a network where everybody works together to complement each other, we can um, uh, avoid those types of decreases in service. Uh, and second, the, the fact that we are an organization, the organization that we are, that we come to you all, elected officials, I mean, well, it, not that it would ever happen, but if we were in charge of Innovage and two years before they were shut down, you got a report, I think all of you would knock on, on Doug Rex's door. Um, that's one of the great parts of a council of governments and a nonprofit itself running this type of network. So those two uh, areas uh, uh, are complementary to that great fear you have. Uh, and frankly, it's one I, I share as well. Um, we don't want to compromise service. We want to provide more quality service to the people in our community. And, and we think this is the best way to do it. So that the, both of your answers were just perfect, actually, <laughs> really, 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 really helped me a lot with this. And is there, um, it, are, would another entity, a for-profit entity, actually be eligible to be a community care hub? Um, I worry about, you know, there are some, some of these Medicare managed care yep. or entities that are it's Just becoming a big business, actually, and and uh, there are national companies that are trying to organize and get people uh, together. And it, to be honest, I've been in calls with them, and their their motive is profit, profit, profit. It's not service, um, and and that's where we get in trouble. Um, we need to cover our costs. Absolutely, we need to be able to add more service to our community. We're a nonprofit organization. Um, they, it has to go back into service, right? But there are several um, nationwide organizations trying to, unite us is one um, that's trying to get a network of providers together so that they're able to capture these dollars on a national, um, at, at, at a, you know, in different regions. Yeah, um, and, and also um, there's no, um, so far, there has been no energy to have a, a federal designation as a hub or a community hub. So it wouldn't be like the, the Air Agency on Aging. It's more of a, of a entrepreneurial uh, endeavor. And yes, uh, you can look at the uh, evolution that a couple of insurance companies have had. Uh, there's been basically three steps. Uh, they're all completing step two. The, the first step is, um, uh, let's do something about this. Uh, the second step is we're gonna buy technology to do something about this. Uh, the third step is, wait, the technology doesn't really help our, <laughs> our clients, patients, members. Um, and now they're coming to the realization that we need to find the local organizations that have that knowledge, that historical knowledge. Um, and I'm on a, a national work group that's developing a billing code so community organizations can bill insurance companies. Um, and that's a very serious step that they wouldn't take unless they were serious about working with community organizations. However, um, uh, that's not to say that, uh, you know, uh, UC Health, a Kaiser would try uh, to organize a network like this. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. Question from uh, Sarah Nermella. Is that a correct pronunciation? Yes, it is. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so just on that question about, um, and, and AJ, you kind of got to it at the end, where if, if we have um, our hub in motion, does it at all compete with any private entity trying to do the same thing? Or do you kind of get to have some exclusivity? as a hub in a region does that make so, sense I, yes it does and and i've been i've been grappling with this question the uh the hub and and network in oregon 
uh, is comprised of all the AAAs statewide. Uh, and they have um, an agreement with all the AAAs and their contractors that uh, they won't compete against each other. Um, so uh, they, you know, the transportation organizations uh, won't negotiate against the hub itself or the, or the network itself. Um, however, uh, you know, this is a, a, a big area. Oregon is very different from uh, Colorado uh, in terms of its, its culture and its business environment. Um, I don't think we would be um, uh, competing with organizations because the organizations that, that for the most part do, these, do this work are not for profit. Um, and so they, they don't have necessarily a profit motive. They have a service motive as, as we do. Um, but there, um, there might be in the future situations where uh, we are um, working um, uh, not in, in tandem. <laughs> I don't know how to say this well. I, gave, I uh, sold my business years ago, so I gave up the for-profit life. Um, but uh, we wouldn't work to the detriment of anyone. Uh, but we would try to work cooperat collaboratively um, across the region. Good, thank you. Other questions? Well, thank you, AJ, and thank you, Jayla Sanchez Warren. I apologize for mangling your name at the beginning. <laughs> That's okay. Somehow I got tangled. I, I, <laughs> it's been a long day. But uh, thank you both so much for the information and, and we look forward to continued conversations and, and we still appreciate all that the AAA does. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. With that, are there any other announcements or any other matters of business before we adjourn? All right. Uh, the next meeting is the board meeting on November 16th and the next work session is on December 7th. So until both of those. Thank you all very much. Appreciate you being here tonight. And thank you for all you do as a part of Dr. Cog. Bye. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you. Be safe. Bye. Have a good night.